I wish there were more sure things in life. I'm trying to say the word sure. I don't know if it's coming out. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Am I saying that word right? Sure. S-U-R-E. It sounds funny in my head. Maybe I'm just a crazy person. Uh, I, I wish there were more sure things in this world. I, I, I know for a long time I looked at things that I thought were sure things. And I'm like, okay, I can totally trust in this. It's got me. It's not going to fail. It's going to come through. And then it failed. And I was shaken. I was like, oh, I don't like when sure things don't, aren't sure things. I don't, I don't like that feeling. Um, I turned 40, no, 41, sorry. I thought my health was okay. Eat okay, try to exercise a little bit. Last week I looked left and my neck's totally broken. All I did was look left, right? I, I, that's it, that's it. So if I don't look at you today, it's because my neck. Like I thought life and health was a sure thing. I thought relationship was a sure thing. Family will always be solid. Friends will always be solid. Everything will always be solid. Um, yeah, and, and now I'm just discovering that something that I consider a sure thing might not play out to be a sure thing, even with high percentages and high probability and stats and odds and all these things that we can wrap our heads around. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean something probable is going to be actual. What I'm hoping to do today is kind of disconnect probable or high prob probability from promise and, and say, all right, we can build our lives on promise. Like there are some sure things in this world that will not leave us, uh, that will not fail us and leave us shaken. And, and I believe the work of Jesus in our life is probably the main thing. Right? The, the sure thing, the solid thing, the thing that's not probable, the thing that's promised, the thing that is for us and solidifies our souls in really, really sweet ways. So we started a message series last week called Ghost Stories. For five weeks, we're going to study the Holy Spirit. Back in the day, 200 years ago, the, whole, uh, the church called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. So that's why we picked up on ghost stories, and we're going to tell some stories over the month of October. And, and I hope that they're going to provide security for our hearts. Like, I, I, I want to know that there's some things in this world that are unshakable. I think that's Jesus' love for us. I think that's Jesus knowing us and being for us and, and desiring relationship with us. I, I, I think we can, we can stand on that at all times. And I'm trying to get that in my head and in my heart. So anything that Jesus said, I believe is a sure thing. One of the things that Jesus said in the book of Acts is that he is going to send the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. Now, what's fascinating about this moment is that Jesus had uh, lived his life and, and he was sure, like he was, he was certain, he was stable. At the end of Jesus' life, he was arrested and he was examined, he was executed, he was crucified, uh, he, he was buried, and then he resurrected. And in between his resurrection and ascension, ascensions when Jesus went to be with the Father in heaven forever, there were 40 days that resurrected Jesus walked on earth. And he was talking to his friends. And he's like, this is what I want you to know. And this is what I want you to do. And this is what I want you to be sure of. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we see one of his promises. So this promise is going to be on the screen. I would love to read this out loud together because it's really fun and sweet to hear God's word come out of our mouths. So Acts 1, 8 reads like this. Um, let's do it. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this language is a little confusing to me. Like it's talking about some ancient places, some places we don't live, some places we probably haven't visited. But that was the place where Jesus lived in the place where the church was visiting. And he said that anyone connected to him is going to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the beauty of the Holy Spirit is that throughout the Bible, God had promised the Holy Spirit to people. Before Jesus came, the Holy Spirit would only uh, be with kings or priests or prophets 
or leaders, the Holy Spirit came on people's lives to do a significant work. When Jesus showed up on the scene, he got baptized, and it says that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus when he was in the water in like the bodily form of a dove. And when the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, he did miracles. Before the Holy Spirit came on Jesus, Jesus was just a dude, and I don't don't mean it like that. He's God, but he wasn't flexing his God stuff. He was regular. He was passable. You would look at him and be like, that's just Jesus. He's he's just he's just a guy. But when the Holy Spirit came on him, he started doing incredibly significant things. And, and, And then Jesus tells his people like the Holy Spirit is going to come on you. And when the Holy Spirit comes on us, we are going to do significant things. And the things that we're going to do, one, we're going to know that God loves us and he's for us. We're going to walk in love. We're going to be full of love. And then we're going to express God's love to the people around us. And people are going to experience Jesus because of us, because of you. Like where you work and where you go to school and the sports teams you play on, everything you do, people are going to experience God because the Holy Spirit is in you. So the Holy Spirit, it's important to understand it is a promise that was fulfilled. Again, with with a world that's not super sure, it's nice to have some some sure things. The Holy Spirit is a promise that God made to people, and that promise has been fulfilled. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14, we hear really good news. It says, and you were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who was a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of God's glory. So, This language, this letter that Paul is writing to a church, he's like, I want people to be sure that we know that God loves us and lives in us. I don't want to project too much of my stuff on you because I got my stuff, you got your stuff, we don't need to mix our stuffs. But like one of the things I've struggled with deeply trying to be a Christian was does God really love me? Does he, if he knows me and he sees me, does he really want me, right? Does, does, on my good day, I kind of think that God loves me and wants me and is like, oh, look at Mike, he's trying hard, A for effort. And then on my bad day, he's like, look at Mike, he's a mess. Why do I even bother with him? I don't, I don't want relationship with him. And, and I lived in this based on whether I considered myself good or bad based on whether I deserve to be loved by God or to be uh, like God, to be like, no, I, I don't love you. And my friends, it was so hard. So hard for me to navigate that. Does God love me? Does he not love me? Do I love God? Does it, do I not love God? One of the way we're going to frame it today is how do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm saved? How how does everyone in this room know I am saved? I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we see the word saved, that's that's a Bible word. And it's a church word. It can be a a confrontational word. And it can even be a word that we might pull back from. But in this moment, this morning, saved. That's like we want to be like, yes, I know that I'm saved. Because God is a saving God. Save connects to salvation. God is a God of salvation. Save connects to rescue. God is a God who rescues. This is who God is and what he does. So I want to make sure that this salvation, this included in Christ, is applying to our lives. So how do I know if I'm saved? The first question becomes, have we heard? Have you heard what salvation is? Back in the day, God created Adam to be in relationship with him. At the moment of creation, Adam was perfect. God created Eve. 
Eve is perfect. So now you have God who is perfect and Adam who is perfect and Eve who is perfect. And there's no relational strife. There's no disconnection. There's perfect unity, perfect love. Until the moment Adam says, I don't want to listen to God. I'm going to do my own thing. Like God was like, Adam, this is what I have for you. This is what I want for you. You've got this entire place, but please do not do that. And Adam does the thing that God asks him not to do. That's what we call sin. Anytime I do what God asks me not to do, or anytime I do not do what God asks me to do, the language I use for that is sin. I know sin. It's in my life. It's in my heart. You know sin. I believe it's in your life. It's in your heart. It's okay. Because God knows how to deal with sin. So Adam sins. And and relationally, it could cause him to be cut off from God. But what we see God do is he's like, Adam, I want relationship with you. Relationship requires perfection because our God is perfect. If we want relationship with God, we need to be perfect. I am so imperfect. It's ridiculous. So God creates a system where I can be credited perfection. In Adam's day, it was the death of an innocent animal. In Jewish history, it is the death of an innocent animal. They would have a holiday once a year, the Day of Atonement, where an animal, multiple animals were were sacrificed so that sin could be placed on innocence and innocence could be placed on people. And even though I'm sinful, I am innocent in the eyes of my God because God is saving me and God is rescuing me and he's offering salvation. When Jesus comes on the scene and he's in the water and he's baptized and the Holy Spirit comes on him, John the Baptist says, that is the Lamb of God talking about Jesus. And he takes away the sins of the world. I am imperfect, but Jesus is perfect. And instead of receiving eternal life and and, and a reward appropriate for perfection, what Jesus received was death on a cross for my sin. Like he died for my sin. I put my sin on Jesus. When I'm like, Jesus, I believe in you. And Jesus died for my sin. And Jesus' perfection is credited to anyone who says, Jesus, please take my sin. So I'm not perfect. You're with me five minutes and you're like, this dude's Not perfect. But you know what? God the Father, my creator, he sees me as perfect because he sees what Jesus did for me. Each and every one of us have an opportunity for God our Father to look at us and see perfection because Jesus died for us and he took our sin. He took the sin that was done to me. He took the sin that was done to you. I don't minimize that. Dude, I got trauma and scars and hurt and pain and you do too. And we're not making that little. I am really thankful that Jesus died for it though. And then I hurt people. And I've lied and I've cheated and I've forgotten and I've disappointed and I said I'm a sure thing and I wasn't. And I sinned against people. And God forgave that on the cross for me. And I'm so thankful. And I've sinned against God. Anytime I've sinned against people, I've sinned against their creator. And Jesus died on the cross for that, for me. This is the offer. I'm not perfect, but Jesus is. And he says, I can be perfect if I trust in him. And I'm saying that we can be perfect if we trust in him. That's how we have relationship with our creator is by coming through Jesus. Anytime I try to have relationship with God because I think I'm good, man, it doesn't work because I'm shaky. Anytime I try to have relationship with God through Jesus, it works all day. It's not shaky. It's solid. So I believe that is the gospel that that is the good news that you and I get to carry to the world around us, that everyone is sinful, but no one has to pay the penalty of sin because Jesus did that on our behalf. We can trust in him. We can believe in him. 
So that's our next idea. How do I know that I'm saved? I hear that Jesus died for me. I hear that I don't have to be separated from God. I hear that I don't have to pay for my sin. And in my heart, I believe that. I say, Jesus, I, I, I hear good news and I want it. My heart wells up. I'm warming up. I'm sensing something inside of myself. Maybe my eyes are even watering. Jesus, what you have, I want. I know I'm worked up. You can't ask me to talk about Jesus and not become emotionally erratic. Uh, I just, I am so thankful for what Jesus did for me. So thankful that he's like, Mike, all you got to do is believe. You don't have to behave. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to earn this. You don't have to deserve it. You just have to believe. And I'm like, that's the only means of salvation that would ever work for me. And God's like, good. I got you. Right? That's, that's, that's God's like, good. I, 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 I got you. So I want to ask us, like, do we believe? And a lot of times in church, we, we ask people to make a, a profession of faith in Jesus. A profession of faith that says, uh, Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, which means Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God, which means he's deity. I believe that you died on a cross for my sin. I believe that I am forgiven and filled with your spirit. That applies to us. I, I want to pray that prayer together. I want to talk to God about that. If you've already had that conversation with God, I would ask you to just do it again. Not for, not for any reason other than to make it comfortable for someone that might be praying that for the first time. I believe you might be here. You're like, I believe. I want that. I want a relationship with God. So I would love to lead us in this prayer. Uh, and if you want to pray this, you can repeat after me. Uh, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died for my sin, and you offer me life. I say yes to you. I don't know how a moment like that changes lives, but it can, and it does, and I believe that it will. God is, God is doing something incredible. Like God is, is calling us to believe and trust in him. Uh, last, last Sunday, uh, at our 9.30 service, we had six baptisms. If, if you were here for that, that was a, a party. I didn't call everybody. I didn't call all the six, but I called some people this week, and I talked to a guy named Mike. And so I'm like, Mike, congratulations on this step of faith. Uh, thank you. How are you feeling? He's like, I'm feeling great. I'm like, how long have you been worshiping with us? He's like, oh, I've been worshiping at one church since the beginning of July. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. He's like, Mike, I actually met you that day. He's like, it was a day of a cookout. July 3rd, we were supposed to have a bash. Uh, we rented inflatables. We had the grill set up. We, we, it was a party, and it poured buckets of rain. Buckets and buckets. And I'm like, this day's ruined. Right, God, you're the worst. Right, you don't know how to do the rain thing, apparently. The only thing we did, we had a hot dog eating contest. Yeah, we had a hot dog eating contest. This dude was invited to church that day because he's into hot dogs. His friends, no, I'm serious, this is why I love this. His friends were like, hey, I know you eat hot dogs. Like we're having a hot dog eating contest. You should come to church. He's like, I haven't been to church in years and years and years. And I came and I just never left. It was a hot dog eating contest. Like it's. I'm yelling erratic again, I know. Uh, so, okay, so with that said, God is working in you and through you. The Holy Spirit is in you. The Holy Spirit helps people see Jesus in you. 
This is, that's why God's church is growing. Because you are God's church. And you go to work, and you go to school, and you play on teams, and you love your neighbors, and you love your family. You, God is working. So thank you. So with that said, Colin May's craze, October 28th, uh, we need like 200 volunteers, 200 volunteers. So please, let's do this thing. We're going to invite our friends, family members, coworkers, and neighbors to a beautiful free event. And I believe people are going to feel the love of God. So how do I know if I'm saved? We've heard the gospel. We get to decide, do we believe in the gospel? And then it's, have we received the Holy Spirit? The language of Jesus is the moment that I say, God, I believe, forgive me, lead me, love me, I love you, I'm into you, I believe you're into me. That moment, instantly, the Holy Spirit comes in our world. So, I, I know it's hard to believe that at times. Instantly, it's a promise. It's not shaky. I'm not telling you this. Jesus is telling this through his word. It's something that we can rely on. It's something that we can bank. And, and one of the things that we can do is we can look for evidence in our life that the Holy Spirit is in us. And here's the evidence that we can look for. If we are growing in any of these evidences, if we're growing in love, if we're growing in joy, if we're growing in peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. These are the evidences of the Holy Spirit in my life. Uh, are they perfected in any of us? Probably not. Are they progressive? Are they growing? Yes. So we can say, God, show me how you're working. Show me how you're leading me. Show me how you're shaping me. And our heart can feel steady that we are saved. Because of Jesus. So the Holy Spirit in us is a promise fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is also a seal of ownership. The Holy Spirit is a seal of ownership. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 21 and 22 says, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. He set his seal of ownership on us and he put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. There's a seal on our lives. Back in the day, this seal represented family. If I was writing you a letter, I couldn't call you, Ed. You know what I mean? I, I, I couldn't text you. I, there was, I, I had to write something and, and wrap it up and then I would seal it, and someone would deliver it to you. And when you received it, likely you would recognize the seal, the crest, and be like, oh, that's from Mike. I want to open that because it's probably good. You, we, have been sealed with the Holy Spirit. There's an impression on our life that we live with. That whether our workplace knows it or not, it's the impression of God. Whether classmates know it or not, yet it's the impression of God. It's the Holy Spirit in us showing the love of Jesus to the world around us. You are sealed. Like, that's how God sees you. That's how God loves you. That's how God reveals his love to the world around you. It's his spirit in us. It's not us. It's God in us. I love this. We're, we're, we're sealed. Now, that sealed, and, and, and this is a challenging moment, that seal actually speaks to ownership. So again, if I seal something and I send it, I, I have ownership of it. I have possession of it. It's, it's mine. And that's where I struggle a little bit with God. Mike's like, Mike, I've sealed you. You're mine. Your life is mine. And I'm like, oh, but, I, but my life is mine. And God's like, no, your life is mine. 
And I'm like, for real? And he's like, yeah, like, for real. I, I, I sealed you. I'm, your, my impression is in you. My spirit is in you. Now, it's a tension piece. It's a war that we walk out. I want to live for Jesus and I want to live for me. I want to live for Jesus and I want to live for me. But the most beautiful thing we can do is say, Jesus, here I am. I want to live for you. Like where I go, I want to live for you. I was watching Law and Order a couple weeks ago. I can't believe that's still on TV. Season like 140, right? It's as long as my life has I've lived. Olivia Benson has been on television. And so I'm, I'm watching the show. And it's, it's, it's sad, right? Like, it's, it's sad. It's special victim. You, it's, it's sad. There's a guy that was in prison for a long time. And he wasn't necessarily big and he wasn't tough. And, and, and a gang came and branded him. It literally branded him, burnt him, sealed him. And they're like, you're mine. And he's like, you don't understand. He's just crying, talking to the detectives. I, I, they owned me. They owned me, and I did whatever they wanted to. Again, fiction, sad, whatever. But this is, this, this is life. Like, this is tough. Jesus seals us, but the wild thing is that he was the one branded. Like, he was the one that suffered. When he sealed us, it's, 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 it's he suffered to seal. He took the penalty to seal. He took the pain to seal. And I'm not saying following Jesus has no pain, because I do believe following Jesus can have pain, but, it, but it's not what he felt. And he took the penalty of sin, and he took my punishment, and he took my pain, and he sealed me, and he said, my spirit's in you. I own you. Live for me. I want that. I, man, I, if I'm thinking about one church, what do I want for us? I want us to live Tuesday like, Jesus, I'm yours. And that starts with me looking in the mirror. I can see my reflection in that thing. I know you guys can't see it, but it, it starts with me looking in the mirror saying, all right, God, I'm yours. What do you want from me? And if we say that together, forget about it. Like, it's going to be miraculous. So the Holy Spirit is a promise fulfilled and the Holy Spirit is a seal of ownership and the Holy Spirit is a guarantee of the future. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 and 5. For while we are in this tent, and that's talking about this body, this, this life that we have, for while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Okay, this is the only way I can make sense of this. Life, the life we live, it's, it's hard. In this experience, in this tent, in this body, there's difficulty, there's pain, there's sickness, there's job loss, there's relational death, there's sin, there's all of these things. This life is hard, and sometimes we don't know what to say. And sometimes all we're doing, like we think we can talk to God, but I don't have words, and it's just like a groan, and it's a cry, and it's a, it's a thing. Like, God, if, if you can do anything right now, please do it. But I don't even have words to articulate what I need for you, from you. He says the Holy Spirit is a guarantee that in those moments when it hits the fan, when it's very dark and it's very alone, that we sense that we're not alone because the Spirit is in us, that it reminds our soul that our forever, our eternal forever is not alone. It is with God. It is in His presence. What we experience now, the beauty of it, the power of it, the peace of it, it's supernatural, it's miraculous. One day it will be actual. It will be ongoing. There's no changing. The spirit, when we have these moments that it just reminds us, all right, God is real and his love is real and I'm sensing something right now that's beyond the natural, then that is just a little taste that, all right, more is coming. More is coming. Because one day we will not be here. One day, 
because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, we can be in the presence of our Father and our Creator. To make that happen, we believe in Jesus. To experience that, we believe in Jesus. I want to ask us to believe in Jesus. You are loved. You are known and you are loved. That's, that's that Jesus love. And Jesus gave himself so that we could be restored to our relationship with our Heavenly Father. This cup represents that. So we hold this bread, and this bread reminds us of Jesus. It takes our mind back to the Last Supper, and this was the night before Jesus died on a cross for us. He was with his friends in that moment, and he took bread, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, I'm giving it for you. And they're like, what do you mean? And he's like, you'll see. Like, I'm doing for you what you can't do for yourself. I'm saving you. What do you mean? You'll see. Jesus gives himself for us. And we get to see kind of, but one day, man, we will see. Jesus says yes to us. He offers himself to us. If we are saying yes to Jesus, would you please take this with me? Jesus took a cup and he proposed a toast. And it blows my mind that in that setting, he could raise a glass and be like, I have good news. What's the good news? The good news is that my sin is paid for. And I am connected to my father because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. When he raised his cup, he said, this cup represents my blood. My blood is going to be spilled for the forgiveness of anyone who believes. Jesus says yes to you. If you're saying yes to Jesus, would you please take this with me? All right, we're going to have a moment of reflection. And then we're going to sing some more songs out of gratitude. Uh, Derek is over to my right. When we're singing, if you would like someone to pray for you, sometimes it's really nice just to have someone put a hand on our shoulder and pray a blessing on us. But if you need prayer for anything, Derek's here. If you feel in your soul that God is calling you uh, to be more involved in what he's doing in this place. Again, God is using your life every day, everywhere you go. Uh, and then God is doing something when we gather here. If you would like to volunteer, if you would like to help with Corn Maze Craze, if you would, help, uh, if you would like to help us make this happen, please, before you leave, can you just stop by the information desk and be like, hey, you guys need anything? Or if you have any questions, you can uh, find answers there as well. If you're here and you're like, Mike, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that the Holy Spirit is in me. I haven't been baptized in water, but I would like to do that. Jesus asks all of his people to be baptized. Jesus was baptized and he was baptized for us. So if you would like to take that step of faith and just be like, I'm all in, we have towels, we have t-shirts. Nate would love to connect with you. I'm gonna pray a blessing on us. I'm so thankful that you're here. And I pray that these next couple songs would continue to do sweet things in our heart. Jesus, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit. Thank you for keeping your promise. Thank you for not pushing us away. Thank you for pursuing us. Thank you for, uh, Lord, it, it blows my mind that you want us 
as deeply as you do. We give you our hearts. We give you our lives. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.